Good morning, friends, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We are so glad you're joining us today. My name is Trev Erickson, and I'm the communications manager here. Before the service begins, I wanted to take a minute to help orient you to worshiping with us online. Check out the description of this stream below where you'll find helpful links for you to get the most out of today's service. You'll find PDFs of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even ways to submit prayer requests. And of course, you can always find these things at meetinghouse.church. If you'd like to get more connected in our community, an easy first step is to text CONNECTMC to 55498. As we're getting ready to start this morning, send a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. <laughs> welcome to worship. And welcome also to our friends who are joining us online. As you prepare your hearts to enter into worship, hear these words of the psalmist. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Brothers and sisters, join me now as we prepare to sing our opening hymn, Come Sing, O Church in Joy, number 305. Please be seated. Friends, we have gathered as the church, trusting that God has met us here, that God does want to hear our prayers, our concerns, our hopes, our dreams, that God wants to lead us and to guide us in a world where we have to continually be intentional how we live as Christians for each other and for the neighbors around us, for literally the world, of how we are gonna live out our faith, be faithful to the Spirit as the Spirit leads, and to be a testimony of all of what God wants to do in us and through us. It seems like it's getting harder and harder to do that, but together, as we join together as the community, we buoy each other up, we support each other, we encourage each other, we cheer each other on. Let us be that community and then let that love go out to a world that desperately needs it. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the morning when we rise, in the evening when we lie down, and in all the moments of our day in between, we choose to trust that you are with us and that you love us. 
We especially thank you for your faithful love which always embraces us and promises to be with us in every moment. We need this today and every day. God, give us the strength of faith we need to hold on and to believe. Even when the way seems unclear and even when our circumstances seem confusing and overwhelming. Like the disciples, Peter, James, and John, we long for the mountaintop, but more often than not live in the valley, where we're called to live out our lives with faith and care and compassion and service and love. God, will you help us? We pray today for those who are ill and grieving, for those who are frightened and discouraged, for those who are weary and tired. We especially pray for those of our congregation that need your healing hand, the need to know that you are with them. Be with Brenda Marshall and Mary Wernis and Dave Getch and Joan Veldi and Jean Wydell and so many others suffering in silence, facing tests and challenges the week ahead. We pray that they would sense your presence, that you would put your healing hand upon them. For those who are grieving in so many ways today, we pray that you'll meet us in our grief, bring us comfort, infuse us with that hope that's almost beyond our understanding at times. Be with Pam Badger in the death of her mom. Be with Pete Souther in the death of his uncle. And with others who are grieving the separation from those of whom they love. God, we're grateful for these flowers on the platform today that remind us of all of our loved ones that have crossed over into glory and that we now, by faith, let them dwell there in the community with the saints that have gone before us. But God, we are thankful for these flowers that re rem remind us of Bill Eklund and Barb Eklund, family of Deb and Jeff Eklund. God, we ask that you teach and touch and lead and guide and direct that we might be the community you desire for us to be. Touch each one of your beloved with your healing power, go God, and boost them with the infusion of a hope that we need. Bless us as well as we care for those around us. Give us insight, wisdom, clarity, courage. Oh God, we do seek to be a community, to be a church where we are all welcome, where we are all valued, where we are all celebrated, for you created us in your image. For we know, God, that we are created to be in relationship with one another and that we need all the various parts of the body in order to function. Help us to celebrate that and all that that means. May we be more and more that church and community that you patiently wait for us to become where we intentionally shine the light of your love and hope and freedom to our whole community, to the world. Loving God, on this Sunday, we gather with such a range of emotions and needs. Help us to be conscious of those who need our love and acceptance today. Help us to continue to be the church which cares for the foreigner, the widow, the orphan. Help us to continue to be a people known for its love. God, help us to remember that you are the power and the hope for our souls. Help us to remember that you do love us. Enable us this week to see with the heart of faith and to live and to walk by trusting your spirit, a spirit that will lead us to be the community of care and love and prayer that we desire to be. So hear us now as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples, as we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. front of the platform. <laughs> amen, amen. You know, we as a church want to figure out ways that we can come together for a variety of needs. We're grateful that we can come into this space and actually sit with one another. We're grateful for the technology that allows hundreds of people, literally, from wherever you are to be with us today. You are most welcome that are joining us as we stream. May you sense God's presence. May you feel what it means to be in community with like-minded people, and we bless you. We're trying to figure out ways that we can bring the church together. We're offering a variety of opportunities, whether it be from uh, special events that people are inviting people to come to their homes, all the way to sending kids to camp and everything in between. So we want you to make sure you go to our website. We want you to make sure you look through the bulletin. We want you to stop by the connection corner and ask Michelle Steinke all kinds of questions of how you can get involved and get, uh, become more and more a part of this community. But a few highlights for this day. We've been talking about in these last few weeks, these backyard barbecues. There's actually one today that they now have thrown open the doors. All are welcome. I would love for us to challenge that. I mean, they have a big yard, but I would love it if we just like overwhelmed them and they're like, we won't do that again. <laughs> you, you can stop by, pick up your own lunch. They'll have beverages and desserts there for you, and it'll be just a great time. If you're craving some time within fellowship with uh, like-minded folks, you know what? Stop by the barbecue. Uh, you can go online, find out the details, or stop by again and see Michelle and let her know you're thinking about coming. Just as a little side note, the next one is gonna be hosted by the Lindsay's and the Smalley's in my backyard. So you might wanna think about that. Now, not everybody's welcome for that one. <laughs> Just gonna be clear. You're welcome, but not that night. So, but uh, go online, figure out all the places and situations that are happening and be a part of that. The other thing I want you to know is that uh, we are sending kids to camp. Yeah, we don't have Pyro and Pyro 2, as you might remember. Uh, we're hoping to figure out how camp is going to continue to work in the life of this church. And we've got some hopes and dreams along those lines. But we're still using Covenant Pines, a uh, camp that we have uh, been a part of for a long time. If you've got kids or grandkids that are thinking about wanting to get involved this summer, go online, find out what those dates are. There's still room uh, for those camps and for those opportunities. Another place that we're inviting people to gather is... Uh, for some music here on campus. We're gonna open up the courtyard. There's gonna be some music, some food. That's gonna be uh, on July 11th uh, from 6 to 7.30. We're hoping for a nice night where we can just sit out in, the, in, in front of the bell tower that's uh, being repaired and listen to some music and be together. There's lots of other things happening in life of this church, so make sure that you go online, find out what's happening, plan to be involved. Now, speaking of being involved, and here's the good news, George, as you're coming to send our kids off to God's garden, there's actually some kids, I saw them in the meeting house today. You also need to know, you also need to know that there's a whole bunch of other kids across the hall in the alternative service. It's, there's lots of kids and lots of families and lots of life happening in the life of this church. And so we're going to gather them now. George, thanks for all your good work. Let's, let's send them off to God's garden. That sounds great. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, friends, we're going to send off for God's garden and we're going to meet all of our other friends uh, in the alternative service as well. We're going to sing our God's Garden song guys, for our Sundays. And yeah, I think we know it. We'll sing it together. One, two, three, four. Come, oh come, come, come to the garden. garden. Gather round, come without fear. Know my name here in God's garden. All are welcome here.
know how this works. Let's, as they go, we'll say, have fun, kids. One, two, three. And George, try to have a little fun too, okay? okay. All right. Don't we love George? Oh, we love what he does. We love that team that's working with our kids. All the emerging generations are doing great things. God is here. God offers you a peace in the midst of a world that we need it to be. So let's be a part of that. Let's stand and pass the peace to those around us. And the peace of Christ be with you gathering with us online. Morning, morning, morning. And bless. Good morning. I'm reading the, the scripture for this morning. It's Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Living God and Lord of life, we give thanks to you for this day. Grant, O Lord, that our hearts may be open to your word and spirit that our imaginations may catch fire as we discern our place in your story. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, 
and also to be with my friends who are online, those of you who are watching, we hope and pray that you know that you are welcome here and blessed and we love you and uh, look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. I have a manuscript prepared and I'm ready to preach it, but I, I feel remiss if I didn't say that uh, on Friday, some pretty amazing things happened in our, in our country. Um, I don't know what to say yet about that. Uh, I don't know if, if Jeff, you know what to say either yet. Um, but we're praying for our community and we're praying for each of us because we each stand on such different sides of that issue. So my sermon is not going to directly address that, but I want you to know that I'm not stupid. <laughs> I watch the news. Um, I know what's going on. Um, I just don't have anything just yet to say about that. So let me get back to my manuscript. You know, good stories really have uh, the ability to fire the imagination. And great stories, like some of the great epic stories, they have the ability to capture our imagination and even to rewire the way that we see and interact with our world. When I, as a young man, first went off to seminary, I was... I think it'd be fair to say ill-equipped and naive. Yeah, it's hard to believe, right? <laughs> I was not a good student in high school or college, barely, barely making it through. I had very little theological education under my belt, and I had little stamina for reading long academic treatises and articles. After my first year of school, of seminary, I decided I needed to take a break from reading academic theology, but I didn't want to lose the muscle that I had, had gained of reading longer texts because that is just a part of seminary life. So I decided I was going to read some fiction that summer. And what I did was I wound up reading through as much of the works of J.R.R. Tolkien as I could get my hands on. At that point in my life, I had never yet read uh, any of his works. So I read the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I read The Hobbit. And then eventually I read what really became probably my favorite work of Tolkien's, The Silmarillion. After that experience, that summer, I was genuinely struck by how much my imagination had been reshaped maybe even renovated. It wasn't that I thought that there were elves and dwarves and balrogs and rings, etc., running around in the world. It was rather the moral imagination that Tolkien works with in those novels. His emphases on friendship and loyalty and trying to do what is right, even in the most dire of circumstances. These were all hugely important in the way that Tolkien told his story, and they became important to me as I thought about what it would mean for me to navigate this world. Now, Tolkien was really important at a certain point in my life later on, but there was another epic that touched me much earlier. I can still remember the sunny afternoon in May of 1977. That's right, 1977, and I can remember it. I was only five years old, but I still remember to this day running out of the theater with my best friend, Scott King, and in the middle of the hallway, just outside the restrooms, we shouted at one another, I want to be Luke Skywalker. No, I want to be Luke Skywalker. Okay, I'll be Han Solo then. And then we proceeded to make 
our best lightsaber sounds and laser gun blasts as we began our lifelong love affair with the world of Star Wars. Star Wars, with its cast of complicated characters, it left an indelible mark on me. And I even passed that love along to my children, my two sons, both of whom love to argue about the merits of the prequels versus the originals versus the sequels. And if you talk to my son Elijah after the service, he will be happy to give you, a, he's right now gesticulating in his seat, <laughs> as you can see. Now granted, I can, what I'm about to say to you, I can really only say some 45 years later, but I think what really touched me about Star Wars underneath all of the special effects was the fact that Luke was looking for something. He was searching for his father. Now why did that matter to me? That mattered to me because I was a child of divorce. My parents divorced when I was about two years old. And at five years old, when Star Wars came out, my mom had not yet met my stepfather-to-be, Tom. And even though I was very young, that didn't mean that I was unaware of this burning question that would be with me basically the rest of my life. Where is my father? Where is my dad? Where is my protector? Luke's relationship with Obi-Wan Kenobi, the mentoring and the stories of their adventures, the fact that this older man saw something in Luke that other people didn't seem to be able to see, that was what really captured my imagination. That was what drew me in. That was why Scott, who was also a child of divorce, and I both immediately wanted to somehow live in to that drama that we saw on the screen. We saw ourselves in that story, however far-fetched that might sound. That was what captured our imagination, and that was what captured our hearts. And just as an aside, as I was preparing this sermon, which I think I'm going to lovingly call the Star Wars sermon at one point, I was talking to my wife, and she told me that she'd had a similar experience with Leia. She said that beautiful, tough, and smart woman who could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone, leading with her heart and her passion, that that was someone that she identified with. You see, the greatest stories are the ones that leave spaces where we get to enter in and see ourselves also in the drama. They have an arc and they have a form to them. And we have a place. And I believe, frankly, that this premise, this idea about what a great story is, this is what underlies much of the New Testament. You see, you and I, we are a part of God's great drama, a drama that has been unfolding for a very long time. Our world was brought into being by the living God as an act of love and grace. And yet this world also tears itself apart. It needs healing. It needs liberation. And so God, seeing this need, has come into this world and has come alongside of us in our need to set us free in Jesus. And what is more, to lift us up and to invite us into the great drama 
of setting the world right. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, the big words that you sometimes hear in Christian theology. In the simplest terms, this is God's epic story and we have a a part to play. We literally have a role to play in God's good work of healing this world. And I think that that truth is made nowhere in the New Testament more forcefully than in the book of Acts. Now, as many of you know, we've been traveling through the book of Acts since Easter, focusing on this broad theme, the church on mission. And as we've traveled together, we've learned about some of the stories and the challenges and the hopes that animated the early Christian movement. We've been reminded that God, and especially the Spirit of God, was the central actor in the story. But at the same time, people, average everyday people, and the communities that they live with, they also got a chance to play a role. Though, to be fair, often that role was one of catch-up, since the Spirit consistently acted in unexpected ways, turning upside down some of the community's most basic assumptions. Now, Acts tells us a story that starts in Jerusalem, and then over the course of many years, and following after many individuals, it moves through much of the Eastern Mediterranean world until it comes to the center of that world, the city of Rome. We meet a cast of characters, some of whom we might be able to relate to, others of whom seem rather foreign to us. For instance, when I preached a few weeks ago on Tabitha and her work and witness among the widows of Jaffa, many of you resonated deeply with her. Why? I'm sure each of us have different reasons, but I think in the whole, it's because she was making a difference and participating in God's great drama through the simple act of making clothing, which was an act of restoration for widows. That's something that we could be resonate with, something that feels within reach. At the same time, of course, we've probably had a harder time with some of the visions and the persecutions that we hear about in the book of Acts from people like Peter or Paul. No matter what, though, the overarching feeling that one gets when one reads Acts is that it wasn't written down just for posterity's sake. It wasn't written down just to preserve these stories and events. No, it was also meant to make an absolutely vital point, which is this, that the story isn't over yet. The story isn't over yet. And I think that point is especially on display in our passage today, the last two verses in the book of Acts. Now, until relatively recently, commentators have not really known what to do with the ending of the book of Acts. It's very short, it's very terse, it doesn't answer a lot of our questions. And to be fair, endings of stories do typically try to offer some kind of closure, but that's not exactly what happens here. Now, since we uh, had to skip over, I think, a fair chunk of the second half of the book of Acts, let me just tell you that sometime around chapter 21, or about seven years or so before uh, Paul winds up in Rome, he gets arrested. Paul gets arrested in the city of Jerusalem, and he's accused of crimes against Israel's laws. 
and the laws of the empire. He then is eventually sent on his way to Rome where he hopes to gain an audience with the emperor to plead his innocence and perhaps to preach the gospel. As I just mentioned a moment ago, these events occur over a pretty long period of time, somewhere around seven years. And we get a fair amount of detail regarding certain aspects, like we get a lot of stuff about nautical information. I don't think there's a longer passage in all of Scripture that talks about uh, how to sail a boat. Uh, But check it out if you're interested. (laughs) But what we don't get at the very end is an answer to our logical questions. What happens to Paul? Does Paul make it before the emperor? Is he convicted or is he set free? The ending of Acts leaves these and other questions unanswered. At the same time, though, it actually opens up a space of possibility for us. The concluding verses read as follows. Quote, He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I think there are two things worth mentioning in light of this. The first is the description of Paul and his way of being. And the second, of course, is what to make of the abruptness of this ending. So first of all, like other figures that Acts follows, Paul is described here in terms that reminisce to us Jesus. What Paul is doing sounds an awful lot like what Jesus did. He is depicted as doing two of the things that we find Jesus doing consistently throughout the gospel, extending hospitality and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. We're told first that Paul extended hospitality, quote, to all who came to him. He chose to welcome anyone and everyone. Like Jesus before him and like the new communities of Jews and Gentiles that were forming across the Mediterranean world, Paul does not discriminate. He welcomes everyone who comes to him. And who might that have been? It would have been certainly the poor, the fatherless, the motherless, the widows, women compromised by the choices of others, the sick, the abandoned, the enslaved, the free. It would have been Jews and Gentiles. And it's really not hard, frankly, to imagine that were Paul not a prisoner, he would have gone out into the larger city of Rome seeking to spread God's hospitality wherever he could. He would have gone to the prisons and the hospitals and into the byways and the alleyways to make it known that all indeed are welcome. For what else did he do? What else does the text tell us that he did? He told the story, the story. He shared the great drama of God, which had begun among his own people, the people Israel, and which was now unfolding in Jesus and the Spirit. The text tells us that he didn't hold anything back, that he spoke with boldness and without hindrance. He offered witness to God's good work of setting the world right, a reality that was happening right then and there through the life-giving presence of God's Spirit. 
And as he did so, explicitly or implicitly, he was inviting any and all into that same drama and showing them in a very practical way what it would look like to be a part of that drama by practicing hospitality, by extending welcome. Now the fact that Paul did these two things I think is all the more remarkable when we think about his context. <clears throat> Here he is in the very heart of the empire speaking of another kingdom and another king. Two things that Roman officials did not take lightly. Furthermore, Paul is incarcerated. He is not the guest of the emperor. He is his prisoner. His freedom is curtailed even if he's only under house arrest. And on his several long year journey to Rome where he was supposed to stand trial, he's been subjected to plots to kill him, death threats through legal and illegal means, shipwreck, snake bites, and constant opposition. By any account, a wearying journey, both physically and psychologically. And nevertheless, here he is, offering hospitality and witness. What is it that enables Paul to do this? I would suggest that at least one thing is that his imagination, his heart has been so deeply shaped by the Jesus way that he cannot abandon it, even in the crucible of imprisonment and the threat of death. He saw his place in God's story and he chose to lean into it, no matter the cost. He was adding his lines, telling of the redemption of all people through Jesus, telling of the restoration of creation. Acts ends abruptly. That's true. But it's not because Luke is a bad storyteller. I think it's really because he doesn't believe that the story is over. Now, even if by the time that Luke actually wrote the book of Acts, Paul was already dead, even that doesn't mean that the story is over. Why? Because the story of Jesus and the Spirit, it lives within us, but it also lives beyond us. The story of the kingdom of God made manifest in Jesus, that story includes us, but it's also more than any one of us. Acts ends abruptly to make the point that though a chapter of the story might have concluded the story overall, it didn't end. In the end, it's not solely about Peter or Paul or Barnabas or any of the other names of apostles or communities or individuals that we hear about. No, the ups and downs of the life of the Christian churches and people of faith, frankly, around the world and the many different ages and cultures and language and geographies in which they've all lived, that too is also a part of the story. Indeed, we are a part of the story. We have the opportunity to provide our own chapters to this story. The Spirit still speaks. The Spirit still moves. The question then that opens up 
that really is put to us is what story are we going to tell? Well, I would suggest that as we think about that question, as we discuss it with one another, as we ponder it, and as we write it, we let our own imaginations be shaped by the same twin gesture that we saw in Paul, hospitality and witness. I know, speaking for myself personally, that one of the things that attracts me time and time again in the gospel is the deep theme of welcome. In creation, God calls into being that which is not God, gives life to us, says yes to us as an act of sheer grace. God works in the world, in Genesis it tells us, to make a space for us where we can thrive. Likewise, we see in the Gospels, perhaps even more concretely, that Jesus is constantly ta sharing table fellowship with anyone and everyone, with friends and enemies, insiders and outsiders alike. And Acts presses this even further as the walls that divide the ancient animosities are torn down and Jews and Gentiles alike are invited to the great feast prepared for God's people. Friends, we live, frankly, like most other people, in a time of great division. Communities, nations, churches, families. Indeed, sometimes we find that we're in conflict with ourselves. But perhaps our role in that context is simply to welcome all people with the open hand of hospitality and with the joy that marks human fellowship. To welcome them into our tables, to our tables, into our homes, into our community. Loving them with no asterisks, with no accept this, just loving them in the name of Jesus. People that come from different places and different backgrounds, those wounded by the world, the poor, the outsider. Where can we play our part in God's epic story of creation, fall, and redemption? Where can we be co-authors in God's restoration here on earth. In a scene from the Lord of the Rings, I think it's at the very end of the first novel, as Bilbo is finished inking his epic tale of The Hobbit, he gives his journal to Frodo, and he says, I've left some pages in the back blank for you, for you to write your chapter. As we imagine our story and we seek to live into it, I pray that we find the transformative and radical truth of God's welcome at its center. I pray that we find that it is calling us into new life. It is calling us into a diversity that is in unity. It is calling us into an ever-expanding love. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we long to know what our place in your great drama might be. <laughs> Give us the eyes and the hearts to see how we are being invited into your ever-expanding love. Not only that we might experience it for ourselves, but that we might pass it along to all those whom we meet. 
for the glory of your name and the good of our neighbor, we pray. Amen. Again, I maybe need to see maybe a psychologist or something because I mostly identify with Chewbacca <laughs> in the movie, so I'm a little worried about that. But I, what, I, what I appreciated about your word today was it was kind of a reminder as we think about the story unfolding and the, and the future that's ahead of us, we get to help write those chapters. We, we get to participate. Uh, and, and if we can... Uh, Imagine, use our imaginations, and we can see it in our heart and in our minds. We can lead, that can lead us. We can, we can head towards that. And we can set some goals for ourselves and for this church and for the community of faithful people. 
We, we can make a difference. We can make a dent. We can change things if we choose, using our imaginings, led by God's spirit. You know, there's a group of people led by the God's spirit. They're, they're called the GMAT, Task Force, Generosity Ministry Action Team, led by Steve Coleman sitting over there. They're helping us to think about what it means for us to be generous. And they're trying to help inspire a larger understanding of generosity and how that can expand to the larger areas of our work and our ministry. One of the things they've been doing is gathering stories along the way of where people have seen generosity. And they've captured a few of them on video. We're going to show one of those today. A friend of this congre congregation, Saeed Ackbury, who we uh, helped in uh, 2017, he came, he and his family came as refugees from Afghanistan. And it was one Friday afternoon in July, a hot Friday afternoon, I received a call from a nurse in the family practice clinic. Uh, her mom was overdue and uh, the nurse called me to say, she needs to be induced. Can you help this family get to the hospital? Well, the parents are not conversing in English. The father, they're, they're unemployed. The father is an amputee. I knew where to turn. I called Penny and Don Anderson. They answered the call. So did Vicki Primuth and Saeed Ackberry. And together, they got this family to the, to the hospital. Mom was induced. Little Zenebu was born the next day. And two days later, Saeed brought the new baby home with her parents to, their, uh, to her three sisters. A beautiful story that connects, forever connects members of this family to this family. To that call. There's lots of ways you can respond specifically to the mission of this church. You can certainly um, sign up for push pay, you can sign up online, you can use your phone, you can put a check in an envelope and stick it in the box out front. There's lots of ways you already know about that. Most important question is, how is the spirit leading and how will I respond? Let's pray that we will listen for that leading and, and we'll do just that. We'll be faithful to follow. God, thank you for this congregation. For those in our midst in the meeting house today, for those who are watching online, and those who will watch throughout the week. We pray that you would help us to be a generous church, even maybe more so than we have been, which has been significant. Help us to be as generous as you call us to be with all of what you've entrusted into our care. Bless those who have given, and bless those gifts so that it will make literally a difference in the world around us. For we pray this in your name, amen. A wonderful hymn to close our time of worship, One in the Spirit. Let's stand, turn to page 300 if you like, and let's sing this song together as we close.
that's a beautiful way to end. Right? If the story is going to go on and we get a chance to write a chapter, may that be a chapter soaked in love. May it be a chapter fired by hope. May it be a chapter grounded in faithfulness. I want to remind you uh, next week that we have a single service together. Uh, it will be at 9.30, and it will be out in the courtyard. So that's going to be a very wonderful kind of experimental experience. I have not done that, and it turns out I'll be out of town, but I look forward to the next one. Uh, so please be aware of that, and uh, as you go forth this day, go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, knowing that God is going with you, going before you, going beside you and that you have a role to play in what God is doing in this world. Bless you, brothers and sisters. Amen.